each of those steps that we were just looking at in a multi-step reaction is called an elementary step. Each step has its own activation energy, its own rate constant, and the time to complete all the steps is what defines our overall reaction rate, all those rates that we have been measuring so far. Here's a new vocabulary word for you, molecularity. The molecularity of an elementary step is going to be a positive whole number. It tells you how many reactant molecules or ions, atoms, whatever it might be reacting together that come together during that particular step in the reaction. So just as an example of what we would call a unimolecular elementary step, we just take the element A and turn it into two other things. There's only one reactant molecule or atom uh, in that reaction. So we call it a unimolecular elementary step or a bimolecular, just as a couple examples. Maybe you take two atoms of element A and you smash those guys together to make some products. Or maybe you take an atom of A and an atom of B and you smash those guys together to make some products. Either way, you have two atoms or maybe two molecules coming together to form some products. So we call that bimolecular. And then we have termolecular, three atoms, molecules, particles of some kind coming together to make some products. So you could either have three atoms of the same kind, two of one kind, one of another, or maybe three different kinds. That will all be called termolecular elementary steps. Termolecular elementary steps are really unlikely because just like before we were saying it's really hard for that many molecules to come together all at once, all collide simultaneously in just the right orientation with just the amount of energy to make the reaction happen. Up until now all the rate laws that we have been solving for when we were looking for orders and rate law constants, we had to determine the order experimentally. There's no way that you could just look at a chemical reaction and figure out what the rate law is without doing an experiment. For elementary steps though, you can use your balanced chemical equation to figure out what the rate laws would be. It only works if you're looking at rate laws for elementary steps, not overall reactions. The ones we have been doing, the overall reactions, you have to do an experiment. You have to collect some data to figure out what the orders would be. But that's not the case for elementary steps, as we'll see. So let's assume that these five reactions that we have here are elementary steps they are pieces of a mechanism that show you how you'd put a few uh, steps together to get your overall reaction. If we're keeping in mind that these are elementary steps, we can use the balanced chemical equation to figure out what the rate law would be. So for that first reaction where we just have element A and that's it reacting, our rate law would be our K rate constant times a to the first power. It's a unimolecular elementary step, and so it has a order of one. If we had a and b coming together, our rate law equation for that elementary step would be k, our rate constant, a to the first power, b to the first power, because in our balanced chemical equation, a and b both have imaginary ones, as coefficients. For reaction three, where we have three atoms of element A coming together all at once, our rate law constant, our rate law expression would be K, our rate constant, times A cubed. The three in the balanced equation becomes our order, our exponent, and our rate law. 
Again, keep in mind that only works for elementary steps. It does not work for overall reactions. For overall reactions, you have to perform an experiment just like we did in class with our kinetics lab, with our crystal violet lab, where you determine what the order of an overall reaction is. So four, we'd have to square our A and B would just be to the first power. And for five, A, B, and C would all be to the first, um, force, first order in each chemical, a third order overall. So what's the correlation between molecularity, if it's unimolecular, bimolecular, term molecular, where you have one atom, two atoms, or three atoms, or one, one molecule, two molecules, three molecules reacting, and the overall reaction order, when you put the pieces, those elementary steps together, what's the correlation there? Um, say you determine that a reaction is first order overall, that does not necessarily mean that the reaction takes place in a single unimolecular elementary step. It might, but it might not. And second order reactions, for example, do not necessarily take place in a bimolecular elementary step. There, if there's a correlation, it's quite frankly a coincidence. It just happens to mathematically work out that way but it does not, it's not required if you have a first order reaction overall for it to happen in a unimolecular elementary step or if it's second order overall. It doesn't have to be a bimolecular elementary step that makes that happen. If we're look, comparing the overall rates versus the rates of those elementary steps, the overall rate is limited by the combined rate of all the steps from start to finish, up to and including the slowest step in the mechanism. The slowest step has a special name. We either call that the rate limiting step or the rate determining step. Let's say you work in a car uh, manufacturing plant and you can see the picture there of an assembly line making those cars. And let's say that there are three jobs that have to get done on the car that day, uh, putting door handles on the doors or attaching a wire harness for the radio to work or painting the car. If you're in charge of making the cars and it asks you there, which of those steps would slow you down the most and therefore limit the number of cars you could produce in a single day? Well, putting the door handles on the door sounds pretty quick. Attaching a wire harness, maybe it would take a little bit longer, but painting the car, that would take a long time to paint, allow it to dry. That step slows you down. You wouldn't be able to get the cars out the door as fast because of that painting step. It slows you down. If all you had to do was put door handles on the door and send it out, uh, for driving, you'd, you'd be able to put out a lot more cars. You'd be able to produce many more. So our painting slows us down. That's what we would call that rate limiting step, the rate determining step. But reactions work the same way. Their rates can only be as fast as the slowest elementary step. The slowest step is what's going to determine our overall rate. So it gives you a little picture there off to the side. If you look at those funnels and pretend that those funnels, the top one is step one, the middle one, step two, and the bottom funnel, step three of a three-step mechanism, and the beaker of water, if you imagine that as your reactants at the top, and they have to go through steps one, two, and three in order to turn into our products in the Erlenmeyer flask at the bottom, that little funnel is what's gonna hold things up. We won't be able to get the liquid in the beaker at the top into the Erlenmeyer flask at the bottom until it passes through that smallest funnel. So in the, react, in the picture all the way to the left, 
our funnel on the top is the smallest. It's going to throttle the overall speed of the reaction. It's going to slow it down. In the middle picture, the water would be able to make it through that first funnel relatively quickly because it's comparatively, it's bigger than that first funnel um, on the left hand side. So in that middle set, it's the second step that's slowing us down. And in the beaker and funnel and flask all the way to the right, it's the third step that slows us down. That slow step, that's the one that's gonna determine our overall rate. It holds you back, just like painting a car holds you back. So if we take a second to think about what we've learned so far, if we had a reaction where we took two molecules of NO2, react them with a fluorine molecule to make two FNO2s. And if it, we told you that the rate law for that reaction was K times NO2 times a fluorine, wants to know, could that happen in a single step based on the reaction and the rate law? Well, no, it can't happen in one single step. If it did, the rate law orders would have to match the molecularity, those stoichiometric ratios in the balanced chemical equation. If it happened in a single step, then we would have to have two NO2s and a fluorine molecule all crash into each other all at once. And the rate law would then be K times NO2 squared from that two in the balanced chemical equation times fluorine. And because the rate law that it gives us does not have the NO2 being squared, then it cannot happen in a single step. The rate law for this single step would have to match the overall reaction. And in this case, it doesn't. So it's just not possible. It's also just probably unlikely that that would happen because three molecules, the two NO2s and a fluorine, would all have to come together simultaneously with enough energy in the right orientation all at once. Probably not going to happen that way. This reaction happen in a single step. NO2 plus CO makes NO and CO2. And if I told you the rate law that we've determined experimentally is K times NO2 squared. Nope, that doesn't work. Just like the previous example. If it happened in one step, the rate law overall would have to match the stoichiometry of that supposed single step. The rate law for our step, for that reaction that we see there, if it were to occur in one step, would have to be NO2 times carbon monoxide. And it tells us that that's not the rate law. So it can't happen in a single step. 